The reduction potential literally tells you how good your chemical is at being reduced, right? It's literally its potential to be reduced. That's all, right? A lot of students try and memorize other things and then they'll flip things, remember things in reverse, they'll confuse themselves. But at the end of the day, if you're ever lost, you can come all the way back to the start here and just say, okay, at the very least, I know for a fact the reduction potential tells you how good you are at reduction. Right? That has to be true. Even if you've misremembered other things or you're not sure about other things, this cannot be um, false. Right? This has to be the starting point. So these numbers tell you how good this reaction is at reduction. Right? And now it starts to make more sense. Look at these. Oh, they're all reduction half reactions. Right? They're all electrons on the left-hand side. So these are all reductions. These are all numbers telling you how good it is. Okay? As you can see, numerically it has units of volts. Let's not worry about that because in chemistry we don't really deal with that shit. Um, but you can probably learn more about what voltage means in physics next term if you haven't already learned about that. But once again, basic interpretation. The bigger the number, the better at reduction you are. That's it. Right? So as you go down this list, you are better at doing reduction. Now conversely, uh, since reduction is taking electrons and oxidation is losing it, so they're literally opposites of each other, much like electropositivity and electronegativity, these are going to be opposites. So the more negative or the lower your reduction potential, the better you are at oxidizing. Right? And so that helps us clarify one point already. Uh, do we need to know about oxidation potentials? No, they're actually useless. There's no need to have two types of terms because reduction alone tells you everything. Right? You can work out whether something is good at reduction or oxidation with the one number um, by itself. Okay? So, that's the first basic interpretation. Yes, question? Could you clarify why there are fractions? Why there are fractions in the equations? Um, that, this is more just the way we've decided to balance it. Um, I'm going to mention a few slides time what happens when you multiply these equations, um, which will help clarify. But for now, it's, it's just how they happen to be balanced. Yeah. Well, okay, the problem is I haven't told you yet, and I don't want to suggest too much about what the voltage actually means, but. Yes, this is some number that somehow tells you something about when this reaction occurs. But for now, just, just treat it as an as a, as a indicator, right? It just tells you how good that thing is at doing reduction. Okay? Okay. How can we use this to our advantage? Well, let's combine this with the fact that, once again, there's no such thing as reduction by itself or oxidation by itself. Everything is reduction together. Sorry, redox together. Right? And so... If you bring two chemicals together, if one thing is better at reduction, it's going to force the other thing to oxidize. Right? We actually talked about this back in the oxidizing and reducing agents topic anyway, right? So the better something is at reduction, um, the more it will force the other thing to oxidize. That means if I use this data, I can look at any pair of chemicals I combine and determine who's going to reduce or who's going to oxidize. Right? Remember, that's my objective from the very start. I'm comparing how reactive different things are, and the point is, this list in your data sheet gives you that reactivity ranking, essentially. But it's, it's very analogous if it helps to connect to some other things we've been talking about. This is more just for interest. It's very similar to how, you know, with bonding and electronegativity, when you bring atoms together, the more electronegative one will take electron density, the other one will lose it. Right? That's what we're doing here. We're comparing what happens when two reactions come together. Uh, let's see how this actually works. So for example, let's say I'm bringing these two half reactions together. This can be an interactive exercise. Have a look through your data sheet, see if you can find these half reactions on your data sheet, and I'll get people to call out what their reduction potentials are. Silver plus and copper 2 plus. This one's 0 0.8. Copper is? 0 0.34, very nice. A little pro tip for people to check in case you're looking at other numbers. Sometimes the same element appears more than once in your data sheet. So read it very carefully to make sure you're looking for the right value. If you look around, you might notice there's a copper plus half reaction as well. Copper plus the copper metal. Um, I don't want that, right? So make sure to read it very carefully. Very common mistake. Okay. Yep. Okay, so simplest interpretation like we said. You bring these two together, compare their numbers. Who is going to be better at reduction? 
silver, which is the bigger number. If that's the case, when I pair these two half reactions together, silver is going to reduce, and what's copper going to do? Oxidize, that's it. Right? So that's, that's, that's the usefulness of this, this uh, property. We can compare things, work out who reduces, who oxidizes. Silver is going to reduce in this case. Okay, next example. Copper carries over once again. You guys have a look for iron 2 plus makes iron neutral. See, you see the values for that? Great. Same question. Who is better at reduction? Still copper? But this iron, it's like a it's like 0.4, right? Isn't 0.4 bigger than 0.3? Yeah, the negative sign matters. It's it's still better at oxidation. Why is that? The way I think you can try and conceptually think about this topic um, is really related to the way you can think about gravitational potential energy from, from just junior school, right? Which <coughs> might sound like a stretch, right? Okay, why, why are we bothering to think about this? Um, it's because, for example, let's say you have a ball on the ground, so it's zero meters above the ground. We know it has zero potential energy, right? Gravitational potential energy. If you have a ball above the ground, it has a positive gravitational potential energy. What does that actually mean again if, if something has a positive gravity? Well, what does it even mean if something has potential energy? Stupid question. But still, what does it mean if you have potential energy? Yeah, you can do something, you can generate energy. So it's, yeah, you can do work, right? It's a more physics correct way of saying this. When you release this ball, and if it's open to the ground, it's going to fall to the ground, right? I'm going to say it slightly incorrectly and say it wants to fall to the ground, which is not 100% true. But the idea is it, it released, like it will naturally fall to the ground if you let go of it. The same thing in reverse. If you have a ball on the ground, it won't spontaneously fly into the sky, right? Because it has a lower potential um, than this current state. So in the same way, you can compare different positions and potential energies. You do the same thing with uh, reduction potentials here. It's the same concept, and particularly in this case, right? Let's say this ball is like, you know, minus 10 meters underground, and this ball is like two meters above the ground. Who has more gravitational potential energy? The two meters, right? Like, you don't give a shit that this 10 is bigger because it's, it's literally underground, right? The sign matters. This minus 10, firstly, the minus isn't anything mind-blowing. You're just saying it has less energy relative to zero, the ground. It still has less energy relative to two meters up in the sky. Same concept here. This guy is still better at reduction than this one here, right? I find, and I don't know if it's just me, I find this concept it really helps when I'm envisioning these as, as really like a, like a vertical sort of ranking and thinking about it like that. Same scenario. What's the reduction potential for the magnesium half reaction? Negative 2.36 volts. Same question. Who's going to reduce here? Yeah, same logic, right? Just like with gravitational potential energy, you have a ball that's 10 meters underground, have a ball that's minus 20 meters underground, you don't care if the signs are negative. Who has a higher gravitational potential energy? It's still the minus 10, right? It's still closer to a positive number, right? Same logic here, right? This minus sign, I don't care. It's still more positive than the other. Iron 2 plus is still the better, um, better at reduction, essentially. Okay? Nice. And so the point is, in all of these cases, I don't care what the signs are, right? I can take any two half reactions. I can push them together. I can think about it very intuitively in terms of reduction potential just means how good you are at reduction and predict who reduces and who oxidizes. <laughs> okay? Um, just predict what reaction happens when you mix things together. Kind of, okay, it's a good question. This is exactly what I was going to follow up with. So, just to clarify, when I say silver reduces here, who oxidizes again? In this first example, so what was that? Which chemical in particular? Copper neutral metal, right? So keep in mind, these are two reduction half equations. If I deduce that silver plus is the one reducing, it must be, as I mentioned down here, the copper neutral metal that is oxidizing. 
This guy isn't oxidizing. Okay? He's not forming copper three plus, right? These half equations, they kind of go both ways, right? Reduction one way, oxidation the other way. So you either do reduction this way, or you do oxidation the other way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why the arrows go back and forth. Um, I think more so in your first statement, like they would actually react. So what's the picture for this? This is actually just another way of us thinking about the same displacements from before. This is telling you, and I'm not going to bother balancing it, if you have a solution of silver plus and you put in a chunk of copper in there, they will do this. They will displace each other. Silver is good at reduction, copper metal is good at oxidizing, this is going to turn into some silver metal deposit, some of the copper is going to break apart, form copper ions. Right, they're going to react with each other. <laughs> Sorry, no, good. Okay, I'll say it again. So, the idea here is, to summarize, everything is written as a reduction half equation when you're consulting data from your data sheet, right? But when you bring these two together to make an actual reaction, the one that's better at reduction is going to proceed this way. The one that's better at oxidation is going to proceed the other way. Right? So it's going to be copper neutral, oxidizing up into copper 2 plus. And as I wrote down here, this is the actual reaction that occurs. Yeah, exactly. We're trying to visualize how that would actually work. Yeah. There's a nice little trick around this. Um, take that out. Yeah, I'll mention it. I'll be nice. Okay. So note. This is assuming you have both silver plus ions and copper metal available, right? So what if I flipped it? What if I have a beaker of copper ions? Yes, very good. That was actually the case of before, right? Why we had those two pictures from last week. If I flipped it, if I have copper two plus ions and silver metal, nothing's going to happen. Because copper, you, the two statements are going to say the same. Copper is not good enough at reducing, or silver is not good enough at oxidizing. Those are both the same way of saying it, right? So you need to get it the right way around. Yep. Um, 